All right, so yeah, I'm Rob Ashton. I'm incredibly frustrated um, because I both simultaneously hate JavaScript and love it at the same time. And I'm also frustrated with everyone else who hates it or loves it or vice versa. I basically hate everything and everyone. So I'm probably going to rant a little bit during this talk, and I apologize for that in advance. By the way, feel privileged. This is the first presentation I've ever been to with this MacBook Air, and it's actually plugged in to the screen. This is the first time ever. So I can actually look at you people today. I can see your faces. I haven't got to do this while I'm typing. So it's really, I'm really excited. Um, so anyway, how does it suck? Well, you know, I kind of figured that rather than go through some slides, I'd just drop right back to the code like immediately and show you some of the reasons it sucks. Like, so you're probably quite familiar with all these things already, but you know, let's just do this, shall we? Right, so over here in my crazy folder, I've got some lovely examples. And the first one I'm going to do is I'm going to pop into um, Node, which is a command line thing. I'm going to beef up my size so you guys can see it. Is that, is that good? Can you read that? Yeah. Okay, good. Look at that. I'm a, I'm a Linux pro. Linux pro. Absolute professional. Okay. So anyway, I've, um, I've run Node. Have you guys all heard of Node? All right, I don't care if you haven't or not, it's irrelevant. Um, what I've got now is a JavaScript prompt. That's all I've got. I can type some JavaScript in here, like var x equals zero, and then do console.log. I don't do semicolons, they're stupid. Um, and I can do things, right? Good. All right, so I make an array called my array, and I say, you are an array with zero in it. Good? And that's just that, my array, it's got zero in it. Does my array equal my array? It totally does. Of course it does. <laughs> does it equal not my array? Of course it does. Because <laughs> it's <is> JavaScript. <laughs> Everything makes sense. So, okay, um, let's just uh, clear this and start again. Do another one. I'm going to make another array. And this time I'm going to put into it null undefined, these are beautiful things. I'm going to put in, um, oh, another empty array, that'll be good. Oops, I did not mean to do that. Well, never mind, um, let's do it again. Empty array, excellent. So this is an array with some things in it. Oops, that's no good. Semicolon, semicolon, semicolon. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to do that. Anyway, so there's an array of things in it, excellent. Is my array equal to comma, comma? Of course it is. <laughs> it's JavaScript. <laughs> I got loads of these. Um, is math.min um, smaller than math.max? <laughs> of course not. It's JavaScript. <laughs> don't be daft. <laughs> we don't make sense over here. Okay, do you want to see something really cool? Um, this is a JavaScript program. That consists of nothing but braces, squares, and exclamation marks, and pluses. It's about 90,000 characters long. It's great. If I run it, ah, hello world. <laughs> it's JavaScript. <laughs> now, fine. I'm not going to bother showing too much more of that stuff, but I um, kind of get the point. This is. One of the things that people always raise is when we're talking about JavaScript, they always mention the fact that it's got crazy behavior. Okay, fine, it's got crazy behavior. I'm, I'm cool with that. It's got really odd scoping rules. If you miss a var out, things become global. Um, everything's function level, so you can't do any nested scopes. It's all a bit mental. Um, th this, what's this mean? Well, it changes, of course. It's a dynamic language. We're gonna, consume, we're gonna, we're gonna assume that we all write C sharp here and therefore hate dynamic languages. I'm just going to make that assumption. I'm sorry for the Ruby developers, but we hate dynamic languages apart from Mark Rendell, um, who is kind of somewhere in the middle because he's weird. Further away. I'm too loud. Okay. I always get that complaint. I'm always too loud. Yeah. It hasn't got classes. Oh no. Disaster. We have no sugar. Now, I, I like sugar. I love sugar, but um, not in JavaScript. You haven't got properties. Um, access control, read-only cons, blah, blah. And I guess the big one is bad tooling support. We're going to go, we're going to say that. I'm going to make that statement. These are all the things that people say about JavaScript. I'm not going to comment on whether they're true or not. I'm just going to say this is what makes JavaScript suck in the eyes of most people. Fine. You know, I can, I can live with that. 
So we have this realization, and most people are happy with this realization. You know, it is an hilariously bad language. I mean, you can have so many laughs writing JavaScript. You just, it's just good times all around. It's, um, it's bad for your continued sanity. I've been doing a year of it. Look at me. It's not, not good at all. It will add years to your age. You know, before I started writing JavaScript, I had no gray hairs. I've got gray hairs. My hair's receding. You know, it'll give you a neck beard. Now, I actually shaved, so I haven't got one at the moment, but, you know, most JavaScript developers I've met have wonderful neck beards. I mean, they must be really warm in winter. Uh, they, they don't need scarves. So, I like to say that we go through the five stages of um, grief when approaching JavaScript. When you first code crash JavaScript, you first have denial. And you go, no! I will not use JavaScript. I refuse to use JavaScript. Why would I ever use JavaScript? It's a horrible language. No, not doing it. Ugh. Then you have anger. Why are you making me use JavaScript? Why is, why is this the language that we have to use? We've got good languages. We've got, we got C Sharp, for crying out loud. We've got F Sharp. Java's all right. We can do Java. Why am I doing JavaScript? Ugh. I punch you in the face. Then you have bargaining. And you go, well, can we use CoffeeScript, please? <laughs> I want to use CoffeeScript. Can use CoffeeScript? Can I compile C Sharp to JavaScript? I just, any, anything but writing JavaScript, please. I, I, I'll, I'll be a manager. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm just going to do that. I just don't want to write JavaScript. And then depression. Oh, I'm writing JavaScript. Oh, I'm having arguments about semicolons again. Why is this not this? Why is it now this? What happened, what happened to this? What, what, where's that gone? Oh, no. Have I got function? Is that a function? Is that, is that, is that an int? Is that, I just don't know what's going on here anymore. Oh, no. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm staying home today. I'm just going to stay in bed and drink, and drink hot chocolate. I'm not going to work. I hate it. I hate everything. And then you go, you know, this JavaScript thing is all right. <laughs> and I'm undecided whether this is Stockholm Syndrome or... Um, because, I mean, it, it could be. Uh, it's just... I've been writing it for so long now, I don't know any better. I've, I've come to share an understanding with the language. I actually kind of like it. That's, that's good, um, I think. Um, so anyway, um, I guess the, 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 the point here is what we, what we need, what we really need uh, um, to, to be a good JavaScript developer, because let's face it, it's not going anywhere. It's been over 10 years now. We have to if we want to write applications for people to consume across all their devices, we are now doing web or native. We're not doing, well, anything else. We're not doing Silverlight anymore, apart from people who are, which is weird. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not a fan of that stuff at all. So anyway, what we need is a fast track. So that's what I'm going to try and give you here. I'm going to give you a bit of a fast track. and I'm going to help you through these stages. I'm going to show you some things, ways to work around the problems, and, you know, if you start... Going in that direction, hopefully you'll get through the stages faster. You'll still go through the stages. And don't get me wrong, you'll still do it. You'll still be beating your head against the wall, going, oh, why, why, why? Because it's such a horrible experience. But hopefully you'll get through it faster. So anyway, the first thing you want to do is expose the crazy. Expose the crazy. Bring all the crazy out to the surface. Right? If it's crazy there, we want to see it. So how are you going to do this? Well, let's go and look at something. Um, wow, I can't see anything on the screen. Okay, let's go and look at that. Yeah. Right, there's some code. What's wrong with this code? Answers. No? <laughs> What's that? There's no what? There is no var. There's one there, okay. Anything else? I never use semicolons in JavaScript. They're optional. Eradix. Good one. No one ever catches that. Let's see what's wrong with this JavaScript. Oh, ha. quite a lot wrong with this JavaScript. And this is the problem with JavaScript. Um, this is a. This is what happens. There are many things wrong with this. Okay, so yeah, I'm missing a var. What's the problem with missing a var? X is global variable. I've now put a variable called X in my global context. It's not going anywhere. That's a memory leak. And also causes bugs later down the line. Not a good idea. What else is wrong with this JavaScript? Um, oh, yeah, parseInt. ParseInt's got some fantastic bugs. Um, 
well, bugs. It pauses whatever you give it and tries giving you an integer from that. But if you've got something like, uh, like 0, 1, 0, 1 will come back as 0. You know, you, because you're not telling it, hey, this is what type of number this is. So you have to go, okay, well, base 10. That's, what, that's what's going on here, it's base 10. I'm also missing down here, um, you didn't see it, but um, brace, um, oops, many things. Sorry, I apologize, I meant to do that at all, I meant to do this. Whatever. Also, I had a double equals there, but I've got, I've got triple equals there equals now too. So most of the fun things I showed you before, oh yeah, that raw ID is also global. Wow, I've got loads of things, haven't I? So anyway, this is what I'm talking about. That even I can't write JavaScript without the editor saying, hey, you're doing it wrong, don't you? are doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong. So let's go through this quickly. Global variables, double equals, triple equals, yes. That's basically doing type coercion versus strict equality. You never do type coercion. All those examples I just showed you there, that's because of type coercion. I'm doing equality checks using the double equals, which isn't actually an equality check. That's going, well, try and compare these things and convert things if you can. So is, 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 is false true or false null, or is it not false? Is it falsy? Is it truthy? Is it zero? Is it one? Is it a string? Who cares? I'm going to try and compare those things, and mostly I'm going to say true. <laughs> Some bugs in there. Right? Um, obviously, the global variables, the radix. All of these are very small problems, and yes, they do make JavaScript an interesting language to write, because they are there. So you notice there that my editor actually popped up and said, no, everything's wrong. How is it doing that? This is the first thing you ever do when writing any JavaScript at all, and it's not optional, not optional at all. You go npm install JS hint. Give me JS hint, just give it to me. Or JS lint. You haven't got to do it this way. You can install a plugin to your um, editor. You can make it part of the build process using whatever native tools you've got. Or I don't care how you do it. You need it. You need JS Hint. It not only needs to be part of um, your development um, feedback, but it should be in your build process as well. This command line tool should be part of your build process. And what we do with it is, let's go back to that file again. Um, there we go. And let's put something in there like the X. There you go. X is now zero. Excellent stuff. And I say, JS Hint, that file, please. And it goes, ah, oh, there's errors. And th those are the errors, right? This is really important. Time and time again, I come across projects and people are not using JSLint or JSHint. Um, the difference, by the way, is Crockford's a bit of an ass, and um, only, a bit, only a bit of one, and he's using JSLint to enforce his own personal styles these days rather than just picking up errors. So JSHint was born off that. Crockford said about that project, they're all a bunch of idiots, um, but everyone now uses JS Hint because you can actually configure it to only catch the errors that you actually want to catch. And there's a whole list of them, and they're all fantastically arcane. Um, so if I go and look at my file, configure these things, for example, um, .js hint, there we go. These are all the rules. I have no idea what any of them mean. Um, so don't, don't ask me. ASI, BOSS, Curly, ASI, ASI I know, Debug, Devel, EQ, 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 I, I, don't, I don't know. There is documentation, you go and look at it and you work out what your rules are. And you, you stick these things in here and you agree on these rules across your project and you treat any problem, any deviation from this as a, as a build failure. You just don't allow it, just, just don't allow it at all. So get JS Hint into your project pronto if you haven't done so already. I say, I've integrated it into my editor there, which is Vim, but I also run it as part of my build process all the time. It's highly important. Okay, so that's JS Hint. Great. What's I going to say? There we go. So do this thing, JS Hint. That will deal with a lot of your small problems. Of course, we're still writing JavaScript, so you've still got problems. What other problems have we got? Well, whatever. This is what JS Hint does. Yeah. Type coercion, accidental globals, various build and function gotters, blah, 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 blah. JavaScript. Correctness issues, otherwise known as bugs. We say correctness issue because no one knows what you mean when you say it. You don't, you don't say bug because it's, it's, too, it's too forceful. People go, oh, it's a bug. Correctness issues, you're deviating from the expected behavior. <laughs> we can also say we just didn't document that behavior, and that's why it's, that's why it's a bug. No, it's document the behavior we actually want. So we'll actually blame it on the PM and say it didn't give us good enough requirements. Absolutely. Okay, that's how I go with tests in a moment. So, 
Tests are not optional. Just like JS Hint isn't optional, tests are not optional. And yet, time and time again, we come across projects which have no tests on them. You know, you can get away with an awful lot when you're writing C Sharp. You can get away with a lot of it. But you're going to get so many problems because of typing and some of the things that JS Lint don't come across and some of the weird parsing issues you might have. You just want the tests. So let's go and look at how we might actually go and do that. Testing frameworks are, well, wonderful. Um, oh, yeah, ponies. Look at that. Um, so I've got, got ponies, except as a unicorn. I have a unicorn also. That's Princess Celestia. Um, she, she's, she's from the planet Pegasus, um, just in case, in case you wondered. No. Um, I, know, I know a lot about My Little Pony these days. Come and ask me about that afterwards. Not JavaScript. I'm bored of talking about that. And now it's time. Um, but I'll talk about My Little Ponies like cows come home, or the ponies. Um, all right, so... I was going to look at tests. All right, let's go and do that, shall we? Testing. Cool. All right, so you've got two kinds of tests you might want to write. My first one is simply writing tests against JavaScript itself. Right, this is a completely offline test I've got here. It's a completely, there's no server or anything like that. I'm just going to have some JavaScript and write a test against it. This is, this is fine. This is the kind of thing you'd use if you had a really rich client-side model, which no one ever does, um, and you want to test everything in JavaScript in isolation to everything, like markup, server, etc. You just write these tests. So what I've got here is a little test down here. Hey. This is the name of the test, this is the function to invoke, and this is my code for the test, which I've just managed to mess up because I'm using Vim. And how do I run that? Well, I kind of need to make sure my server's running because I'm not doing that currently. Now it's running, excellent. So good, I can load them in the browser and run my tests. This is an okay way to do tests. You know, you can do some things with markup, you can fudge it around a little bit and do some actual tests against all the various browsers and whatever. It's really boring, though. And it also has the problem that I've got to load the browser to run these tests. And I despise opening my browser to run tests. I mean, you've got IDEs like WebStorm that'll do that for you across all different browsers and things. But it's slow. It's very difficult to do as an automated part of your build process. And generally, it doesn't actually serve that much purpose because the interesting part of the code in client-side JavaScript, most of the part, isn't interacting with your model, which tends to be on the server anyway. It's interacting with all the markup and interacting with... Well, everything. How you're displaying stuff. How you're doing that calculation over there. Again, display that stuff. Nearly every single bug you'll ever have will be DOM manipulation all the time. It's very rarely because I added the two wrong, wrong two numbers together. Um, although it can be at times. So I kind of go back to the whole, well, you know what I want? I want tests I can run completely offline. I, 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 I want that. So. Let's say I've got um, a HTML file here, and it's got some JavaScript on it. It's completely in line, which means I cannot get access to that JavaScript in isolation to anything else. Fine, I don't care, whatever. And if I go to this wonderful file, which I've made, um, there we go. If I click, click, click me, I get Rainbow Dash is the best little pony. She is, by the way. She can run really quickly. She's uh, got a rainbow on her bum, and she goes, Woo! <laughs> so awesome. Um, I'm quite excited about that. OK, so how do I test this? Well, let's have a look, shall we? Oh, I don't want to do that. Oh, no, panic. I do that. Um, not doing that either. I know what I'm doing. Aha. I'm opening a test. It's over here somewhere. There you go, I've got some tests. Excellent stuff. All right. So what I can do here is I've actually got this lovely browser driver thing over here. It's called Zombie. And it's a headless browser. There are two headless browsers out there in the wild, actually three or four, but two are the ones you actually use. One of them is Zombie, which is the one I tend to use. You can see up there I'm requiring Zombie. Zombie is a browser written entirely in JavaScript. Like, completely. There's, there's no native code in there, apart maybe Contextify, but that'll go when the next version of V8 comes out. Um, it's actually got a full DOM implementation written in JavaScript. Level 1, level 2, level 3, 99.9 out of compliance. It's pretty awesome. It's also kind of scary. Um, so what they've done is bundled this into a browser and gone, you point this at a web address, we'll download everything, execute everything, and you can do everything with it. And we'll also give you really cool callbacks. So here I can say, hey, visit localhost, testing. And once you've finished loading that page, once all the events have finished firing, that's a really important one, by the way, 
go and get, go and evaluate this expression and ask if it's visible. So in my case here, I ask, is my div visible? And it goes, no. And I go, hooray. And then down here, I say, hey, when I click the button, again, wait for the browser to finish loading the page, press the button, and wait for that to finish doing whatever it's doing, then assert whether it's visible. And I can run this. And I can say, hey, run that stuff. And everything dies because I'm in the wrong folder. There you go. Wow, look at those tests on the command lines. Awesome. So what I can actually, yes? You absolutely can. So the question there is, um, I've just pulled an object out of my um, JavaScript environment. I've gone, hey, evaluate this jQuery object and give it to me. Well, I've now got access to a jQuery object that's actually something inside that page. And the answer is, the question is, can I manipulate that? Well, absolutely you can. You can do anything you want. If you expose a global variable, you can get access to the global variable. And actually, I must admit, I do that. Um, I have one global variable in my entire application, and that enables me to get my claws in there and change things that I shouldn't really be changing. It's really naughty. Um, but I do it anyway, because I'm a rebel, and I know, I know better. Um, Speed. Well, you see, that's pretty fast. Um, that's actually launching everything and doing everything. We have uh, like 200 tests currently, and it goes in 15 seconds. Yeah. It's. I mean, no, it's not on the laptop. So it's not as fast as doing everything in isolation, but it tends to bring a lot more value because a lot of the JavaScript that you write tends to be kludge. Right? I mean, you do a lot of kludge, and you can try and get the kludge away by going, "Hey, we're just going to do MVVM everywhere." But then you just have a big pile of MVVM. And that's, that's great and everything, but the, the real core stuff is where you're interacting with what's going on in the page. So generally, accept the kludge. Embrace the kludge. You know, just build up classes that do stuff, build up objects that do stuff, or build up nice little things that do things, and just run the whole lot and say, hey, are you working? And you go, oh, it's working. Excellent. That's not to say you can't do tests in isolation using the system as well. Of course you would. If you've got some complicated logic on the client side, you want to test in isolation, go ahead, be my guest, go and do that. Um, most of the time you haven't. Most of the time you have not got complex logic on the client side, so don't bother trying to bring it out into an MVVM thingy and build up five classes to try and say hello world on the screen. That's just a bad idea. You have a lot more code than you actually need. Um, I mentioned I hate everything. Um, I really do hate everything. Um, so this works well. Um, you can run it on your build server. You can run it um, on your laptop. You can do it as part of your build process. It's absolutely wonderful. And you get a lot of feedback from it. The only problem I've got with this is it's written in JavaScript. So you know I said earlier that I don't like JavaScript, but I also really love JavaScript. With my tests, I really value brevity. I really value terseness. I value we had to read what the hell is going on. So I tend to do two things. First up, I build an abstraction between me and the actual code being tested, context object, whatever you want to call it, and that tends to do a lot of the work, which means my tests tend to be one or two lines. But it's still JavaScript, it's still pretty ugly. So I'm going to raise my hand here and say I'm a CoffeeScript convert for this stuff, and I apologize, but I am. Um, at Sebastian's fault to blame him. Um, to really do blame him, I hate myself for it, I feel really dirty. Um, yeah, I do. Um, so here's some tests I wrote in CoffeeScript. Holy moly, is this not beautiful? Does that, does that not make you want to cry? I mean, it makes me want to cry. I mean, it's just, wow. I, I, I built a drawing game, multiplayer. Lots of players join. There's lobbying and score lists and things like that. And the whole lot is completely tested. And my entire test suite runs fairly quickly. I'm not going to run them because I fail. It'll be really embarrassing. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to run them. OK, I'll run them. Ready? Ah! Look at oh, wow, look at this. It's amazing. So as you can see, Mocker thinks my tests are far too slow. It's got little reds over there saying, oh, it's taking nearly a second to run this entire scenario. I don't care if my scenario is taking over a second. You know what? Ever done Selenium? It's not fast. It's actually, and also, it's horrible. It's like really horrible and awkward to set up and debug, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is a really cool way of fast-tracking your way to that kind of result. 
That's not to say you don't still do Selenium, you don't still do real browser testing. Because it is a JavaScript implementation of a browser, it's kind of awful. I mean, basically, you've multiplied two things together which are awful and made something even more awful. Um, but, you know, it does work. So the other project I haven't got installed is PhantomJS, which actually launches WebKit, which is a real browser, and um, runs all the code against that. That's fantastic. It's a lot slower, so I don't tend to use it for that reason. But there's no reason why your common abstractions around your code base, if you have enough of it, can't just drive anything. There's no reason why it can't drive Phantom or, or, or Zombie or whatever have you. It doesn't matter. So you can get a lot of the value for targeting multiple browsers this way too. So I, I love this stuff. This is, this is totally where I'm at at the moment. Um, anyway, I've lost my code. It's over there. Oh, no. Oh, there you go. Excellent. So anyway, tests not optional. The whole goal of what I just said now with JS Lint, JS Hints, and Zombie, and CoffeeScript Mocker, and everything else is when I hit save in a file, I want to run all of my tests. I want to know that my JavaScript's valid. I want to know it now. I don't want to wait for a 10-minute build process to kick off and run all my tests. I want everything now. So you asked how long it took to run my tests. Well, yeah, 20 seconds for that lot there. It's quite a lot of tests. Um, how long does your average build take? Anyone got any um, Silverlight.net projects that talk to web backend that talk to a database, etc.? Anyone got build processes take more than a minute? Two minutes, three minutes, four minutes? How many of you have caught? Yeah, exactly. Keep your hands up. Exactly. Um, we've all been there. And obviously, because we all work at big companies, you've probably got all sorts of enterprise crudware on our laptops anyway, which is slowing everything down even more. So um, I'll take 20 seconds of tests over 20 minutes of drinking coffee, waiting for a build to not finish because it's got one build error at the very end. Um, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. I can write 2,000, 3,000 tests and still be faster than a lot of .NET projects I've come, come, come across. You know, and all you're getting from building is some type checking. So anyway, tests, by the way, aren't optional in type language um, as either, right? I mean, we all got tests for all our projects, right? Yeah, absolutely, all of them, every single project. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm perfect. I'm holier than thou. I'm, I, every, like, even like my Hello World applications, I, I write five unit tests for those things. <laughs> so make sure that every character is correct. So anyway, testing will help save you from the scoping issues that I mentioned. Obviously, type correctness. Passing a string over here, it's meant to be an integer. Well, I'm going to catch that pretty quickly because I've got a correctness issue um, or a bug. Um, and obviously, the main purpose of writing tests in the first place is actually to note down and document what your requirements are. So actually, getting feedback on scoping issues, type correctness and crazy behavior correctness, and et cetera, is just a happy side effect, which is nice. That's so how I currently see it. Um, I could be wrong. So anyway, these are the things I just showed you there. Um, Zombie or PhantomJS, they're the headless browsers of Doom, which are glorious. Um, Mocker is the test framework I was using with Mocker Cakes or whatever. And, and scones, whatever, Seb. Seb in his true fashion is written his own. Um, which is <laughs> which, uh, no one uses yet. Um, apart from us. Um, and CoffeeScript. I'm sorry I brought CoffeeScript into this conversation. It won't happen again. Well, actually, it might. We'll see. Um, we'll see how we get on. How are we doing for time, by the way? So, ooh, look at that. No battery. That's good, isn't it? What time is it? Oh, whatever. Anyway, sugar. I like sugar. In my, actually, no, I don't. I hate sugar. I, what, what, what I'm saying? It's a stupid thing to say. I drink my coffee black and straight. Um, I, anyway. like Sorry? <laughs> yeah, like my men. Yeah, uh, whatever. Um, <laughs> Front row, they're a bunch of tool makers. So anyway, here's my statement on this. I'm going to show you some of this in a second anyway. You don't need classes. You might need objects. Objects are not classes. To me, an object is just a bag of state and lots of behavior over the top. You know, behavior is the important bit there. Starting with just functions can actually really help challenge your assumptions. If you're doing C Sharp and you're doing TDD, a lot of what people do is they, they make, the first thing they do is create a class with some methods on it. I mean, they, they write tests, but the tests assume the presence of a class with methods on it. Well, that's, that's silly. You know, you start off methods, and then you extract those methods and the state going with those methods into the classes that you discover as you go along. And that's generally the idea behind these things. Um, because JavaScript does not 
say, well, everything belongs in a class, dude. Um, you're free just to write functions of state. Just go and, go and do it. You just stop doing that stuff. And when you realize, oh, that state and those functions kind of belong together, I'm just going to put them over here and make an object for them, which is pretty, pretty neat. I'll show you that in a second. So I don't know, the other thing about classes, you didn't do that. Bad, bad, stop. Oh, no, panic. OK, I know what I meant to do there. I am going to head into my dev day folder and show you something. What am I going to show you? Ask me. It's got an OO. That's good. Crap.js. There we go. Excellent. So, this is some Crap.js. And you'll see this a lot. This is actually part of the um, bargaining process that I mentioned. Um, I'm doing JavaScript, but I'm going to implement a class and namespace system and an inheritance system around JavaScript so I can have classes just like I have them in C Sharp. This is what people do. I've done it. Everyone does this at some point. Um, so here I've gone, hey, define a namespace, namespace, a friendship is magic. And I'm going to say, there's a pony over here. And I'm going to define a class and give it an object literal with an unders underscore constructor. I'm going to call that automatically. And I'm going to make a unicorn. And I'm going to inherit the unicorn from a pony oh, down, down here by passing it in. And I'm going to call the super constructor. And I'm going to add a horn to my pony, because a, pony, a unicorn is just a pony with a horn on it. Um, it's, this is true, Seb. They are actually ponies. Um, <laughs> this is a, it's a long-standing argument. Actually, quick poll. Is a unicorn a derivation of pony? Yes. <laughs> Who disagrees with my statement there? Yeah. Who just doesn't, doesn't care? <laughs> you people have no souls. <laughs> no souls whatsoever. I, I'm, I, I'm upset. I'm upset. OK. So anyway. You do this kind of things. So I want classes. I want inheritance. I want interfaces. I want. I want all this. You don't want those things. And the, the horns private. The horns pri horn should be private. Well, I, I think horn is usually something you do in private. It's an implementation detail. So uh, admission there, a horn is an implementation detail of a pony. That's all. That's all okay. <laughs> it's a private object. We don't actually care about it. The horn is usually private. Yeah. Okay. So any anyway. Um, <laughs> Don't do this. Um, don't, I'm, you know, if you do do it, fine. You know, it's, it's, it's a learning thing. You, know, you, you, you do it, and then you realize it's bad, and you stop doing it. And then, oh, look at that. I haven't got any real JavaScript. I'm going to write some for you. Well, that'll be a treat. Live coding. I'm good at this. Um, joking. Um, so anyway, what's an object look like in JavaScript? Well, it's just a function, right? There, 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 there's a, there's a, this is now a constructor function, because I'm going to use it like a constructor. And I'm going to say, well, every single pony has a prototype. And that prototype is going to be a lot of methods. So things like nay, because ponies do neighing like horses do. Um, <laughs> I'm going to run around. Um, I think ponies frolic. So I'm going to do frolic as well. It's, ponies definitely frolic. They, they, I mean, that's their purpose in life. That's why I like them. I'm kind of jealous. I'd like to just frolic. That's my favorite thing to do. OK. Um, like a unicorn. Excellent. I'm going to unicorn. Hey, awesome. Unicorns. I love unicorns. Um, we don't actually need inheritance to do that. what we actually want to achieve here. What do you want to achieve? I've created an object over here. I've got unicorns, got a prototype. What do unicorns do that, uh, ah, shit rainbows. There you go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I read it on the internet. It must be true. All right, so <laughs> a unicorn is just a pony that has <laughs> remarkable behavior attached to it. Um, <laughs> what I actually want to achieve when I make a unicorn is I want to take across all of the pony's behavior. Now, the pony's behavior is dictated by the methods on my pony's prototype. Good. I've also, in the constructor function, I'm going to give it an age, and I'm going to give it a name of, I don't know, Rainbow Dash, because that's my favorite pony. Um, you may have noticed already, a pony. And the unicorn's going to have some state as well, something like this dot horn equals over 9,000. Um, there you go. It's, it's a, it's a very geeky joke there. I apologize. Um, right. So there's two aspects to this. The first off, I need or want to invoke both of those constructor functions on the same object because I want all of the state. And I also want all the behavior on the prototype of my unicorn. Well, it's quite simple. 
You got a method called copy all the methods from one prototype <laughs> to another, and I'm going to pass in the unicorn and the pony, and I'll copy all the, all the methods from the pony to the unicorn. I'll just copy them, just mix them in, put them in there, uh, anything like that. I'll, I'll show you a more brief version of that in a second. Um, I just want to get, I'm get the point across, well. that's what I'm doing. And the next thing is, well, the unicorns simply need to invoke the pony constructor passing in this. So all you have to do, I've got an error, because copy all the methods of one prototype to another doesn't actually exist. Fair enough, I can accept that. So what I use for this is underscores um, function, which is um, underscore.extend. That's all I do. I pass in the prototype object. Great. You know, I, I just use that. I don't really care what people use. There's an inherit, there's a util.inherits in Node.js. There's a, is an inherit module on NPM, which everyone uses. I don't care. They all do the same thing. They just copy methods from one place to another. That's all they do. And that's inheritance, effectively. You know, yes, you haven't got polymorphism. You, you haven't got the ability to do over, overrides of things. You can't declare things as private or protected. Who cares? These things aren't important. I don't find them important anyway. I'll tell, I'll tell you why in a second. This is generally enough. The other reason why not having a class system baked right in is a good thing, and I'm getting annoyed now because it's coming in ES6, is um, how many of you work on projects where inheritance is actually causing problems? Uh, I, I am, right? I mean, it's a massive form of coupling. You've got these objects and have from other objects and have from other objects and have from other objects. You know, there's like six or seven levels of inheritance going on there, and there's all sorts of methods and craziness going on. And you know what? If you have got inheritance chain of like six or seven objects, then yes, you probably do want things to be private, protected, and marked as virtual or sealed or what. I don't care. You might want those things. But you actually don't want to have object inheritance graphs that look like that. You don't want it. Generally, what you want is a bit of behavior from that thing over there, over here somehow. somehow. And that can normally be achieved by either composing a bigger object that has to, those two things together, or just mixing the behavior in again, like I just showed you. Those are much better solutions. So if you just apply a little sanity to the JavaScript that you write, except the fact that classes don't exist, you can be a, a little bit happier. I'm not, I'm not saying you're going to be happy because you're still writing JavaScript. You know, no one can be happy writing JavaScript unless you've been doing it for a year or so and it's taken over your brain and turned you to someone you, didn't, you wouldn't recognize a year ago. That's what happened. Um, properties, same kind of thing. I mean, why do we need them? I don't understand. Um, we actually do have them in JavaScript. It's like object dot underscore underscore dot define property something. I, there's a really long syntax for it. And you can create read-only properties and objects. Well, whoop de do. Um, state? State shouldn't be exposed. Just don't, don't expose it. Keep it in the objects where it belongs and don't let anyone touch it. So yes, the state is all public by default. You can't make it private, but that's what discipline is for. You just go, I'm not going to touch the state ever. I'm just not going to do it. I'm just going to always do everything in methods and have general behavior with my objects. It's fine. Um, as soon as you do start exposing state from little modules or little objects or things like that, it's another real horrible form of coupling, and it's really going to bite you in the ass in a year's time when you come back to that project and want to add something else to it. That's happened to me several times, why so I don't do it anymore. Um, I wrote a 5,000 line JavaScript 3D game in the browser, and man, I can't do anything with that code anymore because everything touches everything. It's a whole orgy going on there. Um, so anyway, you don't need those. You don't need access control in discipline, obviously, we know that, I just said it already. But this is things like public, private, protected, whatever. Everything in JavaScript is public, unless it's in a scope over here somewhere and you can only access from that scope, but then it's normally static, you don't really want that. So when you create an object in JavaScript, everything's public. Well, you know, get over it. Um, you can, if you really want to, Prefix all your private things with underscores. Now, I hate underscores with a passion. For some reason, I've got a phobia of them. They don't look very nice. They, they, they make my code look really ugly and horrible. I, I hate the things. But if you want to do that, feel free. Um, a lot of people do. It's a convention across most Microsoft's JavaScript code, and there's nothing wrong with it. You know, and it, I guess across a large team of developers, it kind of makes things easier for people to know that those things are private. But yeah, no thank you. So, this is the next thing. Tooling. Who here uses Visual Studio? Oh yeah, we all use Visual Studio. 
Resharper? Absolutely. Yeah, let's get those tools out and let's use them. Let's, let's refactor everything, all the things, everything, because we can. Yes. I have solution-wide refactoring. Hell yeah, it's my favorite thing. I've got a solution with 32 projects in. What happens when I change the name of this method over here? I want it changed across those 32 projects. I want that. I want it now. It's a bad thing. It's a really, really bad thing. And I'll tell you why it's a really bad thing. Um, well, hmm. It's a bad thing because if you've got a lot of code using some other code, then that code's probably some kind of component. And that's a component that you're using from that other code. It should be maintained separately and versioned separately. And backwards compatibility should generally be kept with that object. And changing behavior in that object should be a thing you don't do very often, right? You, you grow away from that. And it, you kind of should be doing that in C Sharp, and we don't. We build these big projects with, well, solutions, sorry, solutions, we call them solutions. We have 25 or 30 projects in, and there's coupling across all over the place, and you need the tooling to jump around, you need the tooling to do refactoring, you, you need those things because of the big ball of mud that you've created. And, and that's what we do. We're constantly doing it all the time, and it actually causes a lot of pain. Now, we do actually have these things at our fingertips in um, JavaScript anyway, right? If you're in Visual Studio and you install ReSharper, you actually get quite a lot of help from ReSharper. It's pretty clever. JetBrains are very awesome people. Um, they also have WebStorm, which is their IDE. I would show you WebStorm, but it means installing Java on my laptop, and that's against my principles. I hate Java. I mean, like, I'll, I'll do anything to my laptop. I put wine on it. I've got VMs sitting there doing stuff. I do C occasionally. For crying out loud, I write JavaScript. But Java, that's a line I'm not crossing. So you're not, you're not having WebStorm. That's not happening. Uh, ReSharper, well, I haven't actually got Windows lying on anywhere. But you've all got ReSharper. You, know you know what it does and how it works. So feel free to go forth and ReSharp. How about debugging? We like debugging, don't we? I'll show you some debugging in a second. I love debugging. Good logging and tests will actually save you from the need to do debugging a lot of the time. I know Sebastian will disagree with me because you like your debugging, but I, I don't use debugging ever. Um, that said, outside of the Visual Studio ecosystem, well, you've got Chrome and Firebug. Chrome developer tools are utterly fantastic. Firebug is OK. Unfortunately, it's in Firefox, which is not OK. Um, if you're doing server-side JavaScript, you've got Node Inspector, which is basically um, Chrome pointing at a back-end process, doing exactly the same things you're already used to. That's utterly fantastic. But WebStorm, if you want it, you hit a 5, it'll launch your appropriate browser and do all the debugging all in line. Um, fantastic. You know, you've got those things. But again, generally, you don't need them. Good tests and good logging will generally set you free. And they also have the awesome advantage, which means when you're in production and you get issues, well, you look at the logs and you go, oh, bugger, got that wrong, didn't I? Egg in my face. You fix it. Code completion. This is always an interesting one. It kind of goes hand in hand with the refactoring support and things like that. But you can avoid the needed code completion stuff by keeping the context you need for doing a piece of work small. What do I mean by that? Well, if I'm in Vim, which I tend to use most of my stuff, if I can't keep all the context required for a piece of work open in a single Vim instance, I've probably got too much context. I'm probably touching too much code. I've probably done. I've probably composed my application in incorrectly. So what you do there is listen to the pain, and you go, "I'm feeling pain here. I don't like it. This is, oh, it's all. Oh God, it's not very nice." And you fix that problem. And when you fix that problem, everything comes great again. Um, again, tooling hides this a lot of the time because you're always going there. And I mean, I used to do this as well. You you come across a new API you haven't used before, and the first thing you do is go x dot. What methods have I got? Uh, that one looks roughly like what's meant to do. I'm going to use that one. Variables, it takes these, I'm just going to, looks like a null or a zero. I'll just put those things in there and that's, that's going to work. I'll hit a five and see what happens. Ten minutes later, when it's built and you've got your coffee, it doesn't work. And then you go and look at the documentation. And that's the point, really. If you're not reading the documentation of the APIs you're using, then you're kind of boned already. Um, a lot of the JavaScript modules that we get in um, the NPM, the package manager, tend to have a single entry point, which is kind of cool. So um, you'll have an index.js, whatever they call it, and that will contain a list of all the methods that they're exposing to you, everything they expose to you as a developer to go and do things with. And that means generally what I do in Vim is I just open that file. 
I just opened the code that I'm using and look at it. And Gnome is quite well documented and descriptive. I know what's going on there. So you generally don't need it. That said, if you're using Sublime with Vim, I mean, they do, they do word completion. They can do tags. They can do things like this. They're not, they're not stupid beasts. So if it's just the keyboard presses you like doing, well, type the first two letters or the Pascal case derivative, hit shift and tab or whatever, and get your word done for you. So you haven't got to do lots of typing. You just don't get the drop-down boxes with everything in them, which I actually think is going to be a bonus. Again, WebStorm is clever. WebStorm is clever because it does all this stuff for you. ReSharper, again, also clever does stuff for you, but they are crutches. So what I'm trying to say is tooling is optional, and uh, they're, they're an enabler. All right, they they enable you to do something you shouldn't be doing, uh, and this you know they shouldn't be doing that. Um, they should have just gone to gone to Lou like a little boy, or whatever. Um, but they hide the more fundamental issues in your code base. So it's it's quite nice to step back from that tooling and and try and try and operate without it. It's been a very educational experience for me over the past year as I've realised what an awful developer I am. Um, realised I can't work the way I always worked. Um, I haven't gone back to C-sharp yet, but I suspect it's probably changed a few things about how I want to do that. We'll find out, I guess. Okay. I, I, I threw this in last night because I know I'm going to get asked questions about it all the time. TypeScript. Application-scale JavaScript. That's what they call it. Um, second coming of JavaScript. I said, oh. um, Application-scale marketing. <laughs> Um, I mean, that's all it is. It's just, it's, just, it's, it's more marketing bullcrap. Um, now, my main issue with TypeScript is that it is just marketing. Um, right, the, there's very little substance to what they've said about it so far, which is a shame. And first, before talking about that, I'm just going to point something out I just mentioned before. Application scale. What is application scale? What on earth does that mean? What do they think it means? I've got a code base. It's got 100,000 lines of code in it. Is that really how it looks? That's not how it looks, right? I haven't got a code base that looks, well, actually, I do have code bases that look like that. They're not very good code bases. You know, um, they normally look like that. Each of these things are independent. You work on them independently. They're small projects. I have not got an application, web application scale, blah, 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 whatever. I haven't got one. What I've got are little things, talking to little things, and that's a formally defined contract. And that contract's the important thing. I'm going to look after that contract. I'm going to define that contract. I'm going to evolve that contract. And maybe that's where, oh yeah, well, that's application, yeah, whatever. Um, fail. <laughs> Good picture. Um, so what, what, what is application scale JavaScript really? You break things up, use a module system like AMD or CommonJS. I'll show them to you very briefly in a second. They're not very exciting. It's JavaScript for crying out loud. Um, and you don't do large applications in JavaScript. Life becomes brilliant and happy and wonderful. That said, that interface, that boundary, yes, Mark? I know it does because it's ES6. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I will, I uh, promise. Um, so TypeScript, you can alternatively augment JS you've already written with a definition file and get some tooling support. Maybe that's where its value is at the moment, is if you write a lot of JavaScript um, and you end up saying, ah, I've developed a module. This is now a component. It's standalone. Maybe at that point, generate definition for it might be a good idea as a form of documentation for other developers and formalizing that relationship. Maybe. Right. So we've had tooling to do that kind of thing for a while, but no one uses it because it's a huge pain in the ass. So um, maybe if we can make it not be a pain in the ass, then people will use it to do that. I'm going to give it a go and see how that works. I'm not going to hold a strong opinion on that. That said, it does come with things like ES6, um, so the class system and the module system, that's fantastic. Um, and I like that they're going in line with the future versions of JavaScript. But that's one of the problems of JavaScript, is it's evolving very slowly. We've been waiting for classes in JavaScript for eight years while everyone argues about how they should be implemented, you know, because it's everyone trying to cook the same, same stew. It's really not good. Scoping is a massive argument in that, in that context, too. Um, so I'm going to quickly show you what modules look like, but only very briefly. Um, let's go and look. Uh, modules. So this is what um, a project looks like without modules. 
You have a bunch of scripts, and they're included, and everything is wonderful and fine. There's some ponies, Rainbow Dash, Unicorns, Prince Celestia, blah, 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 whatever. Um, they've all got independencies, so the order in which I include these is important. Maybe later on you want to bundle them together, so you write a batch script to concatenate them all in the right order, and it's all horrible, and it's okay. You know, you can get away with it. Um, we actually wanted a way of explicitly saying, hey, this module uses this module, and this module uses this module, and this module uses this module. You ain't going to build application scale JavaScript application scale without modules. So what we've got is CommonJS, which is a standard for doing this kind of thing. If we open up ponies over here, we see we export a function called make pony. That's great. And if I open up um, another one, so unicorn, we can see unicorn actually requires make pony and then uses make pony to create a pony and then exports its own function called make unicorn. And you make these relationships um, explicit. This works well on the server and works well when you're doing bundling, but that basically means you're limited on the client side to using only one file. And you're limited to using only one file on the client side because you can't request these things asynchronously because all these are synchronous calls. So that makes debugging and actually working out where errors were quite difficult. So that's where AMD comes in, which is another standard, the implementation of which is Require.js, very exciting. And it looks something like this. You put everything in a function, a call define, say, here's the function, and then you return the object you want to give to the world. That's all you do with it. But what that means is, in Unicorn over here, I can say, ah, I can, um, I can require ponies. I can use the ponies and, and return my unicorn. I can do that. But it's asynchronous. So what this means is when I ship my code, I can bundle everything together in a single file. But when I actually develop my code, I can ship everything to the browser as an individual file. And the errors I get back from the browser are actually line specific to the file that I actually wrote, which is pretty neat. So these are worth looking at if you're doing application scale JavaScript. That's where you'll actually get some benefits. Um, so anyway. So, T the TLDR, what it said there is boundaries are important. TypeScript as an IDL kind of makes sense, but the marketing message for TypeScript does not make sense. So that's my basic eye with it currently. Um, so, we've got pretty much finished, basically. Um, my summary of all this is JavaScript is crazy, but most of the problems are solved. The small problems are solved, like um, typing and um, crazy syntax and crazy behavior, fine. Those are all solved problems. We have, we have things to help us with that. Um, that's, that's wonderful. The big problems, the actual problems we actually face generally are the same problems we face in C Sharp and other things, which is how we actually put everything together. That's where the real pain tends to expose itself, and no languages under the sun are going to help you with that. You know, everyone goes crazy about CoffeeScript because it helps them with the context and the scoping and things like that, but all CoffeeScript really is is a way of avoiding writing for loops. You know, it, it's just, it's insane. Um, so what I advise is if you want to get into JavaScript, just go and write some JavaScript, go and build some stuff, and don't, don't sweat the small things. Use the tooling to help you if you really want to, and get on with it. In a year's time, you too can be a victim of Stockholm Syndrome like me, and um, we all know that everyone wants to be like me, so that's cool. Um, <laughs> Hopefully your minds are appropriately blown. Um, have we got time for some questions? Have I, um, three minutes, four minutes? Cool. Any questions? Because I know I washed over some things. What have you got against what have you got against semicolons? Sorry? What have I got against semicolons? I haven't got anything against semicolons. I just find it easy to edit JavaScript that hasn't got semicolons. If I want to add a new um, variable declaration, all I have to do is go to the next line, comma, variable name. I haven't got to go and edit the semicolon, come back down here again and do that. I haven't got to do that. And it's kind of awesome. I mean, I, there's lots of little things like that in my editor that I just, I find semicolons to be annoying. They get in my way. So I don't use them. And that's a whole argument that everyone can have. But I'm not getting involved because I, I just can't bother anymore. Um, it's a useless extra character. I'm glad you agree. It is indeed a useless extra character. Go and tell Anders that. that, that oh, TypeScript. TypeScript. It enforces semicolons. Now, to me, like, on principle, I can't use it. I just can't, I can't go there. I, I, why? Why? Mind blown. Again, my mind's been blown so many times this past week. So all these cool announcements. So who said that? Where are you? 
I want to make eye contact with you, but I can't see you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, you talk, talk and like mouth moving. It's impressive. <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you a ventriloquist? I mean, that's awesome. Um, well, so the question was minifying stuff. That's generally not a problem with semicolons. That's what you're driving at. Are you talking about semicolons here? or Right. So um, basically, the way ASI works, automatic semicolon insertion, the way it works is actually really stupid. It goes, oh, I didn't recognize that character. I didn't expect it. I'm going to put a semicolon here and see if it makes sense now. <laughs> That's how it works. It goes, oh, God, there's a, there's a, semi oh, there's a brace. What's the brace doing here? Semicolon. Oh, brace it up. Oh, OK, that's OK. I'm happy now. It's good. So that's how it works. Um, the problem with this is when you minify the scripts and compact them all together, you lose all the line breaks, and you, and you have files next to each other that weren't next to each other before. And then it might throw wobblies. Um, so what I do when I do the cheap way of doing it, the cheap way of concatenating my files, is um, I just put a semicolon in between every single file, and my problem solved. Um, that said, I've only done that one project. Let me show you that project. It's, uh, this is what happens when you don't use a module system, then realize you need one, but you're too lazy to do it properly. You go to um, this project over here, draw more, thank you much, and you open build sh. You do that. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. There's a cat call there, and I'm, yeah, it's pretty bad. Um, don't do this. This is bad. Um, it's caused me a lot of pain. Um, I've had to build a build script that I didn't have to write. I could have just use off-the-shelf tooling to do it for me, but oh no, I went, I'm not going to use a module system. I'm just going to write loads of JavaScript. Yeah, JavaScript, writing code, productive. Um, false productivity. Oopsie. So anyway, um, I'm done now, aren't I? Um, one minute. Lucky people. One more minute of my time. I want to do a dance for you or uh, <laughs> talk, talk about unicorns. I can do that. Ponies. I can... Seriously, you should go on YouTube and watch My Little Pony. Yeah, say, so, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Does that mean you're CoffeeScript users? Does that mean you use CoffeeScript? Is that what you're saying to yeah. me? You're, you're admitting you use CoffeeScript. So the first layer of abstraction. Oh. Are you Ruby guys as well, then, are you? What? Are you Ruby guys as well, are you? Do you do Ruby? Or do you do Don .NET or Ruby? Which one do you do? No. What do you do? And um, what do you... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. It's getting late in the afternoon. Like, okay. What is your server-side programming language? There you go. Got it at this time. Mostly Ruby. Mostly Ruby. So CoffeeScript kind of makes sense for you, then, because it's a Ruby-like. Fine. I'll... I'm going to let that go because you're a Ruby developer. Sorry? Sorry? Real men code in Yeah, real men code in No. <laughs> real men code in JavaScript. It's whether it's, 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 it, and real women, too. Like, all, 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 the, all the cleverest people I know don't mind JavaScript. They don't mind it. Yeah, that's, that's, quite, that's a very strong statement to make. Right, because um, most of them hate lots of things, but they don't mind JavaScript. That's cool. <laughs> I think it's cool. Yes. What's the maximum program size, code size that you would recommend? Well, um, so what the maximum application size is as big as you like. What's the maximum module size? You know, how long is a piece of string? Most of my files are between 100 and 200 lines long. Like those are the files. If I can't really fit on a couple of pages, it's too big. Um, I say my metric is very much along the lines of if a module can't be opened, the context I require in my Vim over here, it's not good enough. I tend to work a lot like this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do that on a, on a smaller screen, it's like, make sense, there you go. Um, whatever. Isn't that beautiful? I, if I can't fit all the context required in these eight files, I've probably failed somewhere. Um, so how long is a piece of string? It's about 800 to 1,000 lines of code, apparently, if I work it out in my head there. Um, it's not a very accurate answer, but I'm not, I don't do accurate answers, because you can come back, they come back and bite me later on. I did my program size 100, 100 lines, and it didn't work. It was, Rob, you're, you're an idiot. 
I mean, I'll get there anyway, but, you know, that's, that's cool. Um, hopefully better reasons. Okay, finished. Thank you.